Hello everyone, here to be the historical books. So today we'll begin with Elijah and the priests of Baal, the confrontation on Mount Carmel between the prophet Elijah and the prophets of Baal symbolized the conflict. Now this is in the northern kingdom. Uh, as you remember, hopefully the uh, northern kingdom has already divided off from the southern kingdom of Judah uh, under the son of Solomon, Rehoboam, and in the northern kingdom it's under Jeroboam. And they set up places of wor worship in Bethel and where's the other one? I can't remember the other the other location. Uh, they set up places of worship in the northern kingdom, and they create uh, uh, calves or, or uh, cows made of uh, gold, golden idols to worship. And so the northern kingdom is uh, already going astray after the division between the two kingdoms. And so Elijah is a priest who is. I'm sorry, a prophet who's sent to confront the northern kingdom and to uh, to confront uh, King Ahab. Uh, and so one of these confrontations leads to a encounter on Mount Carmel between a large number of prophets of Baal uh, and the prophet Elijah. And Elijah wins that contest. Fire falls from he heavens and consumes the sacrifice. Uh, there's been a drought for three years, and God sends rain after this. Prophets such as Elijah become the voice for loyalty to Yahweh. Elijah's successor, Elisha, also participates in the political life of the kingdom by blessing Jehu's overthrow of the Omerid dynasty on page 83. And this, uh, I just wanted to mention the lost tribes of Israel are the northern the ten northern tribes that are uprooted and carried away into captivity by the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians had a custom of uprooting conquered peoples and moving them in mass to a new location and replacing them with a different group. So uh, this is the fate of the northern kingdom. And that brings us today to the uh, latter prophets. Uh, so our previous look at the former prophets provides a historical background for our look at the latter prophets. We will again be concerned about matters of history, literature, and theology as we examine the various books that carry the names of the prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve, which we'll talk more about later. So, uh, I wanted to begin with Elisha and Elijah because of the phenomenon of prophecy in Israel, which seems to have arisen during this transition to monarchy and some of the uh, traumatic transitions that Israel was going through. Uh, the classic expressions of prophecy were oral in nature. Amos and Hosea, for example, came preaching to crowds in the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century BCE, before the Common Era. The classic expressions of prophecy were spoken and written in poetic form, as evidenced in the opening words of the prophetic book of Amos. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds wither, and the top of Carmel dries up. The short prophetic speeches are called oracles, or prophetic words from God. Typically, an oracle includes a proclamation from God, either of coming trouble or of hope, along with a reason for that proclamation often related to the loyalty of the people or the lack of loyalty of the people to Yahweh. These oracles reflect an experience of the prophet with God in which the prophet is gripped by the message to be proclaimed to the people of that day. Prophecy in ancient Israel is a phenomenon from a culture very different from that of the 21st century in the West, Western civilization. In some, it's a speech, it's speech often using shocking language to get the attention of a crowd. So some of the characteristics of human prophecy, um, this is a the classic expressions of prophecy are oral, 
they're spoken, the spoken word. Classic Israelite prophecy most often was expressed in the form of poetry. The prophets spoke in short speeches. An example would be the, in the book of Amos. The prophets spoke in a historical setting. And so it's important to understand the prophecy, to understand the time period that they were speaking in. And the prophetic works eventually come to be written down as books, although they began orally. And uh, this seemed to be something unique among the Hebrews. The common Hebrew term for prophet is nabi. The word prophet, prophet that we use comes from the Greek prophetes meaning one who speaks for another. Uh, the, the author of the book points out that this is somewhat related to the, the, the phenomenon of shamanism. Most societies include figures that communicate between the spirit world and the human realm. Anthropologists use the term shamans. Uh, another thing to consider is ecstatic groups, ecstatic worship or ecstatic devotion. The word ecstatic comes from the Greek ecstasis, which means out of body. And so uh, when someone is part of an ecstatic group or gets caught up in an ecstatic experience, it means they're having an out of body or a liminal experience in which the intuitive faculties can come to predominate. Two of the first uh, of the latter prophets were Amos and Hosea. Uh, they were the first of the canonical prophets. They preached in the Northern Kingdom or they preached in the middle of the 8th century BCE. Amos came first probably in the decade of the 760s before Christ, when the ruler of Israel was Jeroboam II. Amos was a sheep breeder from the southern kingdom of Judah, and thus he was an outsider to the people he was preaching to. He was a man of considerable rhetorical skills and was painfully aware of the faith traditions of Israel and the corruption lying at the center of life in the northern kingdom in the middle of the 8th century. I'm going to go kind of fast because I have a lot to cover today. So Amos says the message of the, uh, his message, the message of Amos is that the day of Yahweh, a day of justice and reckoning for the community of Israel is at hand. Destruction is coming for three reasons, according to Amos. They, they were oppressing the poor, there was a corrupt legal system, and decadence in the religious life of the community. But he ends on a note of hope. In chapter 5, verse 24, he says, Let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. A famous passage about justice. And so uh, there's an insert in the book about social justice which is uh, many faith traditions emphasize the importance of social justice. And in the, the uh, interpretive studies of the latter prophets, it's especially important to understand this concept of social justice. For Amos, social justice was at the, at the heart of the issue of faith. The covenant God Yahweh delivers the community of ancient Israel and thus calls the community to live out this re re right relationship with Yahweh and right relationships with each other, in just relationships with integrity. And that brings us to Hosea, who appears to have been a native of the north, who knew well the community's worship traditions. He eloquently calls the community to faithfulness in the relationship with Yahweh in the latter years of the northern kingdom's existence. As with Amos's prophecies, Hosea's prophecies were preserved and made their way into the southern kingdom to be included in the latter prophets. So at the heart of the uh, story of the, the prophetic message of Hosea is his family life, his marriage with his wife, Gomer. The traditional retelling of the story is that Hosea marries Gomer, who is a wife of Hordom, quoting the scriptures. She bore three children to him, uh, or she bore three children in the marriage. Jezreel, indicating a coming defeat of Israel at the location of Jezreel. Lo Rumah, indicating no forgiveness for Israel. 
and Loami, meaning not my people. The implication was that Loami was not Hosea's son. Gomer leaves Hosea, and in the chapter 3, Hosea goes and finds her and buys her back from a life of prostitution and gradually reestablishes a faithful relationship with her. It was complicated, as they say. Isaiah is the major pro prophetic figure in the southern kingdom of Judah, and in the eighth century, uh, in the eighth century in the southern kingdom of Judah, Isaiah is a significant personage in the capital of the southern kingdom, who has access to highest positions of power. Some uh, people believe that he was of the royalty, and and so he had that position. Something interesting about the book of Isaiah is the question of authorship. A lot of people, uh, traditionally people view the whole book as being written by Isaiah, but those who do the textual studies have seen significant difference from the early part of Isaiah to the latter part. Chapters 1 through 39 relate primarily to Isaiah of Jerusalem. Uh, chapters 40 through 55 come from an exilic, uh, ex exilic prophet who carries the Isaiah tradition into the 6th century. Chapters 56 through 66 relate to a time after the return from exile. Scholars often label these parts of the book 1st Isaiah, 2nd Isaiah, or 3rd Isaiah. There are several reasons scholars suggest multiple authorship of the book. Beginning in chapter 40, the clearly assumed setting is the 6th century, after the fall of Jerusalem. The language and style and concepts change after chapter 40. Prophets spoke to the spiritual condition of their audience and to the issues of their day. So uh, because of the uh, context, because of some of the references to Assyria, first Assyria, then later Babylonia, it is, a, it is believed that several different authors had a hand in writing Isaiah over a period of several dozen years, if not a century. Isaiah's message is related to three crises. Syro Ephraimite crisis around 735 BCE. The northern kingdom seeks to pressure Judah into a military alliance with Syria against the Assyrian Empire from Mesopotamia. Isaiah's view is that the leaders of the kingdom should put their trust in Yahweh rather than in, in any alliances. Some of the famous texts from the prophet uh, come from this time period in Isaiah 9 and also Isaiah 11. The second crisis is the Assyrian threat around 711 BCE. The threat is again loyalty to foreign alliances rather than to Yahweh. The third crisis is the Assyrian sage of Jerusalem in 701 BCE. Isaiah's view is that God would deliver the city, and this prophet prophecy does come to pass. Uh, they end up withdrawing, and Jerusalem is saved. The account of Isaiah's call in chapter 6 provides a good summary of the prophet's message. The prophet has a vision of the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah confesses his sin and responds to the call to proclaim a difficult message to the people who do not follow this holy Yahweh. Also in chapter 7, there's a, a fairly famous uh, Emmanuel prophecy, which clearly relates to the Syro-Ephraimite Syro crisis listed in the text and is recounted earlier in relation to the book of Kings. Isaiah declares that Yahweh will give King Ahaz a, a sign, a child born to a young woman. Before this child will come of age, the leaders of both the northern kingdom of Israel and its major tribe which is Ephraim and Syria will be no more the child is a sign of divine presence divine presence that holds Judah accountable to his faith in Yahweh some interpreters understand the child as a royal child to be born perhaps Hezekiah others suggest that the child is a son of Isaiah in the New Testament Matthew applies this prophecy to Jesus as Emmanuel God with us, who was born of a virgin. 
The Septuagint's translation of Isaiah 7.14 uses the term virgin, although the original Hebrew root Hebrew word means maiden. This brings us up to Josiah's reform. Hezekiah survived an invasion from Assyria at the end of the 8th century, and he was something of a reformer. His, his successor, Manasseh, on the other hand, seems to have supported syncretism and oppression. In 640 BCE, the young Josiah comes to the throne. In 621, his advisors find his scroll as the workers are remodeling and reforming the temple. That Torah scroll shapes a powerful reform in Jerusalem. Josiah's reform includes the following, the covenant renewal and emphasis on the Torah, destruction of worship in the temple, influenced by uh, the destruction of worship, temple worship that was influenced by the Assyrian customs, including divination, magic, or sacred prostitution, a renewal of the celebration of Passover, and also the centralization of worship in the Jerusalem temple. These were elements of Josiah's reform. Unfortunately, the reform did not last, and Josiah died an untimely and premature death. These moves bring significant change in Jerusalem and win praise for Josiah from the Deuteronomic historians. But in the end, the reforms deal with externals rather than the heart or the internals of the community, and so are short-lived. Josiah dies at an early age in battle, and the decline of the southern kingdom is at hand. Jehoiakim, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce that, Je Je Jehoiakim, it could almost be Jehoiakim, is put on the throne, or Jehoiakim, he is put on the throne, whatever his name is, as a puppet of the inf influential Egyptian empire. So you've got Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon manipulating the situation. And the book of Second Kings ends with Jerusalem in ruins and the Davidic king and the leaders of Israel being led away in chains in exile in Babylon. So this brings us into the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was the other major prophetic figure in Jerusalem. Uh, he comes after Isaiah in the 7th century, uh, more or less from 626 to about 580 BCE. His work relates to three time periods, the reign of Josiah, the reign of Jehoiakim, and the reign of Zedekiah. So during the reign of Josiah, Jeremiah speaks of prophecies of judgment, once the reform begins, however, the prophet apparently hopes that the reform constitutes repentance, and he is, in silent, he is silent in support of the movement. During the reign of Joachim, Jua, I can't pronounce it, Joachim, I'm going to say it that way. During his reign, uh, Joachim reverses the reform movement and draws Jeremiah's ire. Jeremiah 19, 20, and 22, and 36 come from this period. The king and prophet have a stormy relationship. Jeremiah's message of coming trouble is not popular with the leaders of the kingdom. Then, thirdly, during the reign of Zedekiah and beyond, this period witnesses the fall of Jerusalem and the beginning of the Babylonian exile. As Judah falls, Jeremiah's prophecies become more hopeful. Uh, the prophets are almost always on the other foot. They're, you know, when things are going good, the prophets are warning of doom. And when things are going bad, the prophets are imparting hope. As Judah falls, Jeremiah's prophecies become more hopeful. Eventually, Jeremiah is kidnapped and taken to Egypt, where his life apparently comes to an end. Jeremiah's task 
that was given to him early in, in the book of Jeremiah by God was to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Two out of three are, are de deconstructive. Other prophetic voices of the 7th century included Zephaniah, who prophesies around 626 BCE and Josiah's reign prior to the reform, Nahum around the same time in 625, Habakkuk near the end of the 7th century, after Josiah's death at about the time that Babylon is conquering Assyria. Prophetic Synax Jeremiah acted out a number of prophecies as symbolic actions, or Synax. He wore an ox yoke to symbolize Judah's coming servitude to Babylon, and he smashed a pot as a sign of coming destruction. He also procured a field behind enemy lines as a sign of a future hope. In the previous century, Isaiah walked about naked to symbolize the coming imprisonment. Some would interpret Hosea's marriage to Gomer as a prophetic sign act, showing jo Yahweh's faithful commitment to Israel as his bride, or Judah. And Ezekiel, also in the 6th century, acted out a number of his prophecies. He constructed a model of Jerusalem to demonstrate its destruction. He cooked food over dung to indicate the difficulties of the sage against the city. He also shaved his beard and hair to symbolize the coming destruction and captivity. This brings us to Ezra and Nehemiah. Ezra was a priest, a scribe, and leads the people in religious reform centered on the renewal of the covenant and obedience to the Torah. Nehemiah was the governor for two terms and led the, in rebuilding Jerusalem and the province. Some people never left the land and are suspicious of the returnees, as others are in the surrounding area. Still, the community re works to rebuild its life. This is after Cyrus, the Persian emperor. The Persians replaced the Babylonians, and the Persians had a different philosophy of ruling and governing, and so uh, Cyrus sent groups of exiles back to rebuild and resettle uh, Judah. So here are some of the major transitions in the Judean region during this time period that we've been discussing uh, fr from the 10th to the 1st centuries of the, before the Common Era. The kingdom of Judah arose from the 10th to the 6th BCE ruled by Rehoboam, by Asa, Jehoshaphat, Athaliah, Uzziah, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Josiah, and finally Jehoiakim. Then another transition came in with the Babylonian period of the 6th century with the fall of Jerusalem, uh, the d diaspora and exile in Babylon. Then a third transition that comes with the Persians conquering the Babylonians and the Persian Empire from the 6th to the 4th century BCE, and during this period of time you have Ezra and Nehemiah are writing, and then the Greek period follows from the 4th to the 1st century BCE, and this covers the Maccabean Revolt, which we'll talk more about later, and there actually was not much prophecy during this period. The prophets pretty much went silent after 400 BCE. The prophets of the exile. The fall of the capital means that there is no king to bring justice and no temple to make atonement possible. The center of the community's world does not hold and the community life is no more. What about the prophets? Many prophets in Jerusalem have proclaimed false hope, and so their credibility takes a nosedive. These were the uh, prophets who opposed Jeremiah. And who were prophesying good good times are coming, revival is coming, blessed blessing is coming, and Josiah uh, Jeremiah was prophesying bad news. Woe to the prophet of bad news. 
This brings us to Ezekiel. Ezekiel's prophetic message just seems to follow two organizational schemes. It generally follows the tripartite pattern we've seen in other prophetic books. One, judgment on Judah and Jerusalem. Two, judgment on other nations. And three, hope for the future. That's a recurring pattern in the uh, minor prophets, or at least the latter prophets. Ezekiel also includes the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones in chapter 37, which envisions a new life for Israel being re revived and returned. The Servant of Yahweh. These chapters also include four songs on the, we're talking about the, uh, the book of Isaiah, I believe here. So in the early part of the book of Isaiah, um, you have you have uh, the eighth century and the context of the Assyrians. One of the themes in the Book of Isaiah uh, are are chapters that deal with the servant of Yahweh, which are in, found in chapter forty two, chapter fifty, chapter fifty three. Scholars have often struggled over the identity of this servant in the context of prophecy. Uh, at times, the servant appears to be Israel, especially in chapter 49. But at other times, the servant appears to be an individual, perhaps a prophetic or royal uh, individual or a new Moses who will lead the exodus from exile. The servant will endure much to accomplish the will of Yahweh. Of course, if, with the stories of the exodus from Egypt, there, there was an expectation and a hope among the exiles that at some point they would uh, God would show up and lead them in an exodus from Babylon back to uh, back to Israel Isaiah chapters 56 to 66 uh, reflect a later time after the return of the exiles to Palestine and the struggles that the return brought for the community as it sought to fulfill the divine promises of restoration Obadiah is a brief book that reflects the experience of exile as well, and it also follows the tripartite pattern we've seen in the other prophets of, of prophecies of judgment on Jerusalem, judgment on other nations, and hope for the future. Esther is, is one of these books. It's a short story from around 300 uh, BCE. The book tends towards a particularist view or exclusive view of the faith community, as does the chronicler's work. The concern here is that the Jewish community survives in the face of opposition and pressures toward assimilation. The idea that God will particularly preserve, preserve the Jews as opposed to other peoples leads the community to nurture its identity and attend to its distinctiveness. This view is not the only articulation of the nature of faith of the faith community, but it is one of the responses to the trauma of exile. The Book of Ruth uh, is another book that goes uh, that is in this section. It takes a somewhat different approach. It articulates a view of divine providence, but it is a hidden providence revealed in the relationships. Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz demonstrate the loyalty in relationships as they survive in the midst of desperate circumstances. The view here tends towards a universal or inclusive view. God is God of all people. Even foreign Moabite women like Ruth are God's people. And in the world of the Persian Empire, the community needs to relate to them. Uh, 300 BCE is during under the Persian Empire. So there's an emphasis here on a a pluralistic or universalistic view of uh, the, the relationship of Hebrew people to other peoples. Ruth is even part of the Davidic royal line through Boaz, who was the son of Rahab. Jonah is another interesting book. Uh, the viewpoint Jonah is in some tension with that in Esther, but both books are important in the Second Temple period as the community seeks to come to terms with the questions of how to live as the people of Yahweh in the Persian Empire by emphasizing their identity articulated in Torah. 
or by emphasizing that our all are, all are created by Yahweh. The brief prophetic book of Haggai deals with the community following their return from exile. Haggai seeks to encourage the people to move on with rebuilding the temple so that Yahweh will be with the community as they worship in a rebuilt Jerusalem. With the political le leadership of Zerubbabel and the priestly leadership of Joshua, the people work at the task of rebuilding. That brings us to Zechariah. The first part of the book of Zechariah comes from the same time as the prophecies of Haggai. The first eight chapters recount a variety of visions in apocalyptic guise, visions of the heavenly horsemen, uh, the iron horns, Joshua on trial, before Yahweh, an angel, a lampstand, a flying scroll, a woman going into exile, and God's chariots. These visions function to encourage the community that their exile is at an end. The community needs to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple as a, as a way to gather the people in the faith of Yahweh. Then there's Malachi. The prophecy of Malachi comes from the Persian period not long after 500 BCE. The people completed the rebuilding of the temple in 515 BCE. Malachi appears to be set between that date and the work of Ezra and Nehemiah. The prophet rails against inappropriate sacrifices in which the priests are leading the community and it rails against the dissolution of marriages in order to better oneself economically. There are some later prophetic voices. Scholars often debate the date of the book Joel. 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 I, I'm, such, I'm so terrible at pronunciations. Joel. Some suggest that it is the first prophetic book, and some think it is the last prophetic book. The book uses a lot of traditional material and seems best placed in the late, late in the Old Testament period because of its language relations to history, and the description of worship. Jonah is a book that's different from other prophetic books in that it preserves the story of the prophet rather than the prophet's sermons. So in 2 Kings, it mentions that the prophet Jonah lived in the northern kingdom during the reign of Jeroboam II. The short story is preserved in the book is somewhat vague about that history, and recounts the story from a distance to articulate a prophetic message. Then there's the Book of Twelve. A number of Old Testament scholars today would suggest a slightly different emphasis, arguing that there are only four prophetic books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Book of Twelve. Scribes have gathered the Twelve, often unfortunately called the Minor Prophets, together as one prophetic collection. This perspective suggests that the readers take the Twelve as chapters in one book of prophetic recollections, rather than twelve different books, and that reading the Twelve as a whole was an ancient tradition. So all the smaller books that we've mentioned would be edited into one, one book with different chapters. Okay, this brings us to our theological reflection of crisis of monarchy and exile. So the former and latter prophets narrate ancient Israel's experiment with monarchy. The prophecies maintain a creative tension between the announcement of judgment and the divine hope that initiated the covenant relationship. Yahweh's steadfast love and faithfulness towards the people. Hosea and Jeremiah provide especially striking examples of this tension. In the end, the final prophetic word is not one of judgment, but of hope for restoration. The people center did not hold, and the life as they had known it disintegrated. So they were asking questions like, what is to, come, become, what is to become of Israel and Israel's faith? And what about Yahweh? The grief is palpable in Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, in, and the struggle in the aftermath of Malachi. The poetries of Psalm 74, 79 
Psalm 137 and the Book of Lamentations articulates the crisis in profound ways. This crisis shapes the story of Judaism. And with that, we conclude week four and the section of the Torah called the Prophets. We shall continue next week with week five. I look forward to seeing you then. Let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to make comments uh, below in the YouTube. And uh, we shall continue. Thank you very much. Take care.